So welcome to Techno Dad Life and my name is Jeff and I'm making this video to help prevent you from having some of the same difficulties that I had and to help you have the best smart home possible at the best benefit to cost. So we are going to look at a couple of different areas so that you have the best experience and the greatest family acceptance. Most of these things I didn't know about when I was first starting out, but I realized that they were more important than getting the best light bulb. I'll also share some of the failures that I had along the way so you can avoid doing some of the same things as me. So we'll be talking about five main things to be aware of when setting up your smart home. Acceptance, control, compatibility, and devices. Uh, I guess that's four. And notice that I said devices last, so let's get started. So just a quick word on acceptance. So the most important thought when doing anything with your smart home project is SAF, or spouse approval factor. Your kids will adapt, your spouse will complain. What this means is actually that nothing can be triggered in only one way. You need to still have a switch or a button besides having voice control and app control. If your spouse starts complaining about things, in most instances, all you need to do is add buttons or a switch so things work the same way. Relationship saved. Control covers a lot more territory. To start with, we need to talk about local versus distant control. So what do those mean? Distant control means that you are dependent on some server somewhere else in the world to control your home. Examples of this are every manufacturer's app of every device you will ever buy. This may not seem like a big deal, but the first time the internet goes down or their, or their server goes down and your house becomes dead in the water, you won't be a happy camper, nor will your spouse. The other problem with distant servers is that you are being spied upon all the time. I know in this age of everything being tracked, this may not seem like a big deal, but do you really want someone to know when you are at home or not? Next, companies like keeping you dependent on their distant servers so they can start adding in subscription fees after a few years to increase profits. These fees have usually been planned out years in advance. They trap you by making their devices cheaper and easier to use together, but difficult to take out of their own walled garden. Examples of this are Google, Amazon, Wise, and many more companies. But there are individuals out in the community who, with much effort, create workarounds for these systems. And we'll talk more about that later. Another danger with devices dependent on distant servers is that if the manufacturer shuts down or decides not to support your device anymore, you are out of luck and you need to throw it away. Finally, the greatest downfall of remote servers are they cause a delay in your response to your commands that can vary dependent upon internet traffic and their server's availability. Local controls means that the servers controlling your smart home are in your home. There are many benefits to this. First, you will have instantaneous response from your devices with almost no delay. The only time your server will go down and lose control of your house is when you turn off your server or when your power goes down. You are not dependent on the internet. Since all your information is staying in your house, your devices can't spy upon you. There's no dark overlords directly knowing what you're doing at any given time. You can use devices from a greater number of manufacturers and you can get features and create automations that are not device limited. Also, there is usually no cost once everything is set up by you and you can fix things if there's a problem. The downfall is that initially it can be much more work. If you make a few simple choices, reliability goes up and complexness goes down. So next we need to talk about the difference between a server and a hub. I make this differentiation because there's things that can be servers, some things that can be hubs, and sometimes they can be servers and hubs. First, a server is simply the device that sends out the directions to your devices and runs all your automations. It usually connects to the device through the internet directly or through a hub. A hub is what your devices connect to to communicate with a server. 
Hubs generally use Zigbee, Z-Way, Thread, or some other proprietary protocol to talk to their devices. Many manufacturers use hubs to connect their devices to their distant servers or HomeKit if this is enabled. Some hubs can be hacked to work directly with your server. Hubitat is an example of a combination server and hub because it has the Zigbee and Z-Wave radios built in. Hubitat is a great way to combine devices from different manufacturers to one hub if you have already purchased a multitude of devices. So let's take a look at three choices for our local servers. We have HomeKit, Hubitat, and Home Assistant. HomeKit is the natural choice if you're already invested in the Apple ecosystem. You just need a recent Apple TV, a HomePod, or an iPad to act as your server. If you have a HomePod Mini, that's probably the best choice at the moment because HomePod Minis have built-in thread support and Thread is the new smart device communication standard that industry leaders like Google, Amazon, and Apple have agreed to use heading forward and should get rid of compatibility issues in the future. HomeKit is also the easiest to set up. If you buy a HomeKit enabled device, you just turn on the device, then scan your code, and it will appear automatically in HomeKit. I would also say HomeKit meets SAF or spouse approval factor if your spouse already uses an iPhone, then they already have the app on their phone to control the house designed in a way that they are used to. If you also have a HomePod, then they will already know how to ask your smart home to do things. HomeKit also has a huge support community on Reddit, so it's very easy to find answers to common questions. Finally, you can integrate non-HomeKit devices using HomeBridge, which is different than Home Assistant, or Hoobs, which is the easy version of HomeBridge. Both run on a Raspberry Pi. HomeBridge offers a compatibility layer that, so that devices that are not compatible, such as the Ring doorbell from Google or an Amazon Alexa, to work with HomeKit. So yes, you can make your Amazon device control your HomeKit devices. HomeBridge connects to Wi-Fi devices directly it needs a dongle to connect to Zigbee devices or a Hubitat to connect to Zigbee or Z-Wave devices. So Hubitat is unique in that it is both a mini server and hub. So it has built-in radios for both Zigbee and Z-Wave devices. It offers the most flexibility in device selections and wants support for their, all their devices out of the box. It also supports adding the major voice assistants such as Amazon or Google. It currently does not have th thread support, but you can also easily change multiple habitats together for large homes or even create multiple accounts for apartment buildings. And it has a friendly forums community. Hubitat has all the same functions as HomeKit, but the dashboard is a little chunky and it is not very pretty. But you can also use Hubitat as a hub and use it to connect to HomeKit and Home Assistant for a better interface that is more spouse approved. Home Assistant is similar to HomeKit, but can be used with both Android and iOS devices. You need a dongle for Zigbee and Z-Way devices, or, or to simplify your life, just use the Hubitat as your hub. It also supports Amazon and Google devices has a very active community who are trying to automate every imaginable device. It is a great system if you like fiddling, as my wife says. Its standout feature is its dashboard where you can add any information that you can imagine, like say your server status. The dashboard interface is definitely prettier than Hubitat, but has a higher entry point for your spouse who might not approve. If you're looking for spouse approval, stick with HomeKit if you use iPhones in your family. Finally, currently Home Assistant doesn't offer thread support, but I'm sure someone is working on it. Phew, that was a lot to cover. But the server is the most important part of your system. You want to make sure you start out with a system that is compatible with your life. Next, when starting out buying devices, make sure the devices are compatible with every system that you are using. Try to stick to one or two manufacturers for most of your devices. In this video, you can see I'm using a Senglid HomeKit compatible hub 
with white lights, color lights, and an LED strip and plugs. Singlet has some HomeKit devices, but is also supported in HomeBridge and is a recommended bulb for Hubitat. Now this seems like a no-brainer, but if you're like me, you will probably just start out buying a bunch of random stuff. Not a good idea. So things to look for. What does it say on the box? Does it say works with Amazon, Google, and HomeKit? Is there some support on the forums for this device? Search the forums of Home Assistant, HomeBridge, and Hubitat. See if anyone else has got this working. Are you willing to invest some time to make it work? So I bought some Wi-Fi plugs that were very cheap, but not compatible with HomeKit, which my wife likes. I found that I could flash a new firmware on the plug, but I needed to first figure out how to write something for this device since my plugs had never been flashed to HomeKit before. I got it done, but I bricked two plugs trying. In my case, it would have been not only easier, but also cheaper just to buy some plugs that were already compatible. If HomeKit ever changes, I am responsible to rewrite the firmware to match the new version of HomeKit. So that's a lot of responsibility. So now it's time to actually pick out some devices. I would start with lights. They are the easiest and most popular things to start out with, and they have the least possible damage to your house. Lights are available in colored, in white, and strips. I find what works for me is that white bulbs are good for the ceiling lights, and then color bulbs are the accent lights. Strips are great for behind things like TVs, furniture, or crown molding. In our house, I put some strips around the top of our walls in our TV room. The glare from the strips makes lines on the TV and the family quickly vetoed using the strips. Besides using voice commands in your phone to control your lights, I would suggest putting in buttons to run scenes and turn things on and off. Buttons greatly increase spouse approval factor Smart light switches can also be installed to prevent your spouse from accidentally disrupting your animations. Just make sure you get the right switch for your wiring. I live in a 100-year-old house that was wired with two wires. Most switches today require a modern three-wire system in your house. So check your wiring before you actually buy a switch. If you're a renter or planning on moving like I am, definitely don't install smart switches. Instead, just rely on your voice assistant and a few buttons. It is a pain installing things and then uninstalling them again. For light switches, I have tried a few and I would recommend the Lutron Caseta switches. They are rock solid light switches built by a company that specializes in making light switches. All the other light switches that I tried are made by electronics companies. Let's just say that most of these switches are less than satisfying. I would not suggest getting smart outlets. You need flexibility because you will want to move things around in your home, so stick to smart plugs. Once you have your first devices installed, then start adding in automations in your software for things like movie night, Christmas, and sexy time. Once you have a hang of that, it's time to move on to infrared sensors, motion sensors, door and window sensors, thermostats, cameras, doorbells, locks, alarms, garage doors, garage door openers, sprinklers, and smoke detectors. Now just imagine for a moment, your house turns up the heat when you're 15 minutes away from home. When you're on your block, it turns on the lights and opens up the garage door. When you pull into the garage, the house door unlocks and turns off the alarm. You walk in the door and a speaker says, welcome home, good looking. Let me know what you wanna do or what you do with your smart home in the comments down below. Please make sure you like and subscribe and hit that bell button to be notified of upcoming smart videos. Take care and bye bye. And a special thank you to all my supporters who without your support, this channel would not be possible. And if you haven't already, please think about supporting the channel you love. Thank you.